Welcome to Trailhead. Again, we are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us this weekend, and, and I'm glad to actually be with you this weekend for the first time in what seems like a really long time. It's good to be here connecting with you today. We are continuing the series that we've been in recently called Seeking Him. Uh, so some of you are working through this. Uh, some of you are doing it in groups. Some of you are doing it as individuals, and, and today we're continuing that. In fact, this week that we're introducing today uh, is a week that the authors of this study just call clear conscience. And I, I don't know exactly how to present that to you other than maybe if you're familiar with 12-step programs to think of the making amends kind of step where you go and start confessing to people, you know, things that you said 12 years ago that hurt their feelings and uh, trying to clear your conscience of that to some degree. It's funny how these things work out. It's funny how all of this ends up playing together, at least in my life. I don't know if it works this way for you guys. But in my life, um, I have had a situation in the last week where I have, you know, initially I was thinking, oh, I've got a clear conscience. I don't really have people that I have to go apologize to or worry about or that kind of thing. Um, and I sure enough messed up things during the week this week and have had to spend a portion of this week going back to family members that I should not have said certain things to and apologizing. I've still got work to do in that area, but it's just, it's just funny how that that tends to work um, where God puts these things in alignment in our lives in certain ways. Not that he planned for me to say really uh, mean or frustrating things, um, but he allowed it to happen at a time uh, where I could definitely learn from it. I, I am learning from this material, and I think the stuff that we're looking at is good stuff. I really agree with a lot of the content that we are going through, so I hope that in that way this study is beneficial to you. Um, that we've been going through over the last several weeks. There is one aspect of this study, though, that's really kind of an undercurrent. And it's not uh, verbally stated out loud. It's not something that the authors of the study say that we should consider or think about. It's not something that they call out necessarily. But it's an undercurrent. It's always there. And it's kind of this hidden value in the study that I personally don't agree with. And so I thought today what I wanted to do was actually just hit pause for a minute. And I don't want you to hit pause on the study. I want you to continue along with the study. Keep going through this week as you normally would. But I'm just not going to going to talk about the topic so much this week as I am going to talk about that undercurrent that maybe you're sensing, maybe you're feeling as you are going through this study, because there seems to be this undercurrent built in here of guilt. And I don't know how you relate to guilt. I'm guessing that most of us would not say, I have a love relationship with guilt. I just want to feel guilty, right? I'm guessing most of us would not say something like that. Um, but rather, we would say, yeah, there are times where I do feel it. Depending on your background, depending on where you grew up, depending on how you started in this faith journey, guilt may have played a big role. And, I, and so I think because of that, this is an important thing for us to hit pause and talk about for a few minutes today. If you grew up and you went to a Catholic school as you were growing up, maybe you had that one nun or that priest that was constantly on you. Maybe you had those uh, things that as you did them, as they came up in your world, the, the priest or the nun would tell you, you have to go confess this because God is upset with you. And then you have to do penance and, uh, you know, pray the rosary a certain number of times. Times. Uh, maybe it wasn't that at all, but maybe you grew up in a certain Baptist circle where the preacher was constantly talking about hell and damnation, and I can't believe you did that, and you've still got that voice in your head where whenever you think of the voice of God, it's almost this condemning, um, why in the world would you do that? It's like God is looking over you, pointing his finger, and he's ashamed of you. Maybe you didn't grow up in a Christian circle at all, uh, but maybe in your family, the way that it worked was when you came home and you had gotten a B on a test in school, you looked up and you thought, 
I don't know if I even want to go home, right? Because you knew the way that your parents may respond. You knew that a B was never good enough. And so you would have this sense of guilt um, as you were walking home with a B on a test. Maybe it was a thing where you got home and you knew that your dad was going to say, you are never going to amount to anything if you keep getting grades like this in school. And so you never loved learning so much, but you always got straight A's because it was a guilt thing that was forced on you by your parents, and and then you connect to a church, and you start hearing about this God who is your father, (laughs) and all of a sudden there's this sense, uh, this hanging sense of, wow, I really have to go above and beyond. I have to check all the boxes if I'm going to please him, if I'm going to be any good in this faith thing. Um, if that's what you have grown up with, or if that's what you have sensed, if that's what you have felt in terms of faith, I'm just going to tell you, I think you have been taught all wrong. I do not believe that's the God of Scripture that we look at. And I want to show that to you. I want to demonstrate that to you today because, like I said, as we've gone through this study, I agree with the content. I absolutely agree with the content. But this undercurrent of guilt and undercurrent of you better do this or else seems to be there. And, and I want to address that very clearly today and make sure you understand that's not the heart of God. That's not the way God draws you to himself. That's not the way that God wants to operate in your world and in your life. In fact, as we've gone through this study, we've just asked the question, we've said, what would our lives look like if we came to a place where we allowed God to come in and revive us from the inside out? Or if we allowed God to come in and heal the brokenness inside of us, what would it look like if God really invaded every part of our worlds? And for some of us, like me, that question is exciting, and th- we, we think, man, I, I want that. I want to be a part of that. But if you grew up with that sense of God hanging over you, pointing his finger at you, and calling you names because of what you've done wrong, <laughs> then you may hear that question and think, uh, I don't know if I really want that. It, so today, we're going to kind of address the question, do I really want God to interject himself in my world? before we continue on with this study called Seeking Him. So if you're at that place, if you're saying, I don't know about this, I'm not so sure, and whenever I think of the voice of God, I hear guilt, I hear shame, I hear those kinds of things, I'm not sure if I want God to interject himself in my world. Let me just tell you, you are not the first one to have those thoughts or those feelings by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, it's incredibly recorded for us in Scripture that the first people that God really called out as his children, as his chosen ones, they had those very same thoughts and feelings where they looked up and they said, God, we don't really know you. Um, I'm not so sure that we want you organizing or reorganizing our worlds in the way that you want to. And they had this kind of back and forth with God that I think we can learn from in an incredible way today. So that story is found in the book of Exodus. You may remember this story that is uh, playing out in the book of Exodus, the exit from uh, Egypt where they are heading up to Israel. Uh, you, You know the story. God tells Moses, go to Pharaoh, let my people go. That whole thing plays out. Eventually, um, because of the 10 miraculous plagues that happen, Pharaoh is getting to a place where he's letting the people of Israel go, um, and and they leave. They don't go directly up to what we know as Israel today, though. They kind of wander around for a while, and God initially takes them over to this mountain called Sinai, and that's where he meets with them And essentially is introducing himself. It's kind of this moment of, okay, here's who I am. You've seen the the plagues. You've seen that kind of thing. But God is saying, here's who I am. Now, remember, they didn't have this. (laughs) They didn't have all of Scripture as we do. In fact, the guy that's kind of leading them is the one that we attribute as the writer, the author of the first five books of this that we know as the Bible. So they didn't have any of it at this point in time. And they're looking up and they're saying, who are you again, God? We think we have heard of you because of our ancestors. We've seen what you've done. 
Um, but we've also heard about all these other gods as we've been here in Egypt. And we're not sure if you're the only God or if there are other gods. And so they're trying to figure out who God is in this midst. And God is trying to tell them, here's how we're going to do life together. I want to do life with you. I want to walk with you. I want to be in the camp with you, right? And so as part of that, he gives them the Ten Commandments, And that's the beginning of him saying, this is the way that we're going to do life together, where I am your king, where I am walking with you in your camp and in your midst. After that, in Exodus chapter 20, there's this long stretch where God gives Moses law after law after law after nauseating law about how to put together the tabernacle. But again, the whole point is God is saying the tabernacle, which is basically a big tent. He's saying, this is the place where I am going to dwell. This is going to be my house in your community. This is how we're going to do life together. Eventually, you may, you may remember the story. God gives them the Ten Commandments. He gives them all of those laws. Moses has been up on the mountain with God for 40 days. And the people start looking around and they say, we don't know what happened to that Moses guy. (laughs) He's been up there a really long time. Maybe he died up there. Maybe he and this God that were leading us out of here, maybe they just took off and they're not around anymore, right? And so they kind of said, we need to make our own God if we're going to move forward. You, You probably remember the story, right? So they get all of their jewelry together, they throw it into a fire, and magically out of the fire, uh, according to Aaron, pops this golden calf, and they start worshiping the golden calf as their God. God, then as he's speaking to Moses, says, Moses, and, and this is one of those instances where you might look at God and say, yeah, that's kind of the God of guilt that I thought he was, right? But what God says to Moses is he says, Moses, your people, (laughs) those Israelites down there, they're now worshiping other gods. And he essentially says to Moses, if they are going to be a rebellious people like this, I am not going with them. In other words, God had been telling him, this is what it's going to look like if I'm doing life with you in your camp, dwelling with you. And now they have turned to other gods and God says, Ah, I'm just going to wipe my hands of this. You guys go on. You go to whatever land you want to go to, but I am not going with you. And it's one of those moments like, what kind of God does that? (laughs) You know, why in the world would God say to them, I've brought you out, and now I'm not going to go with you any further? But do you know what is actually happening here I have a feeling it's probably happened to you at different times. What's happening is God is saying to these people, he's saying, do you really want me to go with you? This is a test. This is not God saying, I'm done with you. This is God saying, okay, I've gotten you out of slavery. Do you really want me to be your God? Do you really want me to continue walking with you? Do you really want me to keep going here? And that's where we're going to dive into the story together in Exodus chapter 33, um, because this is that point where the people are asking, now, who is this God again, and can we trust him to lead us? Can we trust him to meddle in the things of our lives? Can we trust that he is a good God uh, rather than a God who's going to look at us harshly and condemn us? in ways that we don't want to be condemned. So Exodus chapter 33, after God says to Moses, I'm going to go uh, do my own thing. You guys go on without me. Moses responds and he says this. It says in verse 15, then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. Verse 16, he says this, um, after he says, you know, don't, go, don't make us go without you, he says, how will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and your people if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. So basically Moses hears God saying, ah, if you don't want me to go, I'm not going to go. You just go on your own. Moses backs up and he says, wait, 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 God. <laughs> We can't go without you. 
there's no way that we can go and accomplish what we're supposed to accomplish and conquer this nation if you're not leading us in this. And so Moses pleads with God and says, no, no, don't leave us here. If you're going to stay here, let us stay with you, but your presence has to go with us. Eventually, God replies and says this in verse 17, the Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked. For I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. And so there's some really important things happening here. First of all, God says, okay, you passed the test, right? If you really want me with you, I will continue to go with you. And then he says, and Moses, here's the other thing. I'm going with you because I know you. I know your heart. I know that you really do want me to be a part of what's going on here. Before we go too far, let me just stop and ask you a question. Do you really want God going with you? Do you really want God setting up camp in your house, in your workplace? God is incredibly humble in that the the creator of heaven and earth, the God who's sovereign over all things, he also looks at us and he says, I'm not going to force you to do this with me. I'm not going to force my way into this. I'm not going to force you to be in this with me. But if you want to do it with me, I will go with you. And then, like I said, he looks at Moses and says that familiar phrase. He says, I'm doing this in part because I know you. I know your heart, Moses. And, and I think God would look at all of us right now and say the same thing. As we walk through this, he would look at you and he would say, I know you. I know where you've been. I know the things you've been through. I know the hardships you've faced. I know the abuses that you have suffered. I know you. But I think we, if we're honest, a lot of times would probably respond like Moses did. Listen to what Moses says next in verse 18. It says, Moses responded, then show me your glorious presence. Do you know what he's saying? <laughs> He's saying, God, you know me. I don't know you. You've told me your name, right? But I've never seen you, God. I don't know you. And again, maybe you've stood in Moses' shoes. (laughs) Maybe you've been there and you've said, God, if you would just say something out loud, if you would just do that, then I would know who you really are. God, if you would just show me who you are, if you would just give me a glimpse of your physical presence with me, then I would believe that you're really here. Then I would believe that you're really doing this with us. That's exactly what Moses is saying. He's saying, God, if you say this is going to work the way that you're telling me, I need to see you. I need to see who you really are. As the story goes on, we're not going to read all of the verses, but let me just tell you what happens. Basically, God says, Moses, yeah, I'll show you myself, um, but I'm not going to show you my full glory. Uh, you, You may remember that part of the story, but it's interesting to me to think about that because think about what Moses is asking for here. Now, remember, God is outside of time. We are bound by time, but God is outside of time. And so when Moses is saying to God, show me your glory and show me your your glory in its fullness, do you know what that would mean? I, I can't imagine the fullness of the glory of God. But what I do know today is that a huge part of what God would be showing Moses is a crucified man, is a man that was killed and came back to life is what the Bible calls the lamb who was slain for the world. If God shows those images to Moses, what does Moses do with that? There's no explanation. There's no understanding of who Jesus is. There's just this man who looks horrific in some ways because he has been killed. He has been murdered. And Moses has no way to process that, much less the rest of the world around him having a way to process that. And God just says to Moses, you're not ready. There's no way for you to comprehend the fullness of my glory right now. 
and, and I would just remind you, as you cry out to God and say, God, if you would just do this, if you would just speak out loud, if you would just show me your presence, I, I fully imagine that God looks at us in the same way that he looked at Moses, and he loved Moses, but he says, you're not ready for that. (laughs) You have no earthly idea what you're asking for. And so God says, I'm not going to show you the fullness of my glory, but he says this. He says, what I want you to do is I want you to chisel out two new tablets, Remember, Moses got all upset. He, he smashed the tablets that had uh, the Ten Commandments on them. And God says, okay, we're going to replace those. I want you to chisel out two new tablets. Come up on the mountain again by yourself, not with anyone else. And he says, I'm going to put you in essentially a cave in the mountain. I'm going to cover you with my hand. And as I pass by, you're not going to see the fullness of me. You will see my back as I pass by. And scholars, theologians have debated for centuries what that means. I cannot tell you exactly what that means. But basically what God is saying in this moment is he's saying, I'm not going to show you my fullness, but I am going to tell you who I really am. I'm going to explain my name to you. And so that's what happens. If we jump on uh, ahead to Exodus chapter 34, verse 4, we pick up the story there. It says, so Moses chiseled out two tablets of stone like the first ones. Early in the morning, he climbed Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. So Moses just starts doing what God asked him to do. He starts chiseling out the tablets. He goes up on the mountain. God puts him in the cleft of the rock and covers him with his hand. And verse 5 says, Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him, and he called out his own name, Yahweh. The Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. And, uh, let me just back up for one second and tell you what's going on here. As, uh, as God calls out to, to Moses, he calls out his name, Yahweh. Or in your translation of Scripture, it may just say, the Lord, the Lord. But where it says that, it probably has an L within a lowercase capital, <laughs> however you say that, O-R-D, Uh, So the O-R-D are all capital, they're just small capitals, right? That is our English designation of the name Yahweh. And and the reason we do that is because in Jewish culture, the name Yahweh, which is the personal name of God, is so holy and so revered that they will not even say it out loud. So they replace the, the personal name Yahweh with the name Lord, but in order to show us that it's his personal name, they keep the O-R-D and L-O-R-D, they keep that as small capital. So just just file that away for future reference. And, and what's going on is he is saying, Yahweh, Yahweh. He's reminding Moses of his personal name. Do you know what Yahweh means by any chance? Now, if you haven't heard before, the name Yahweh literally means I am. I am that I am, Right? And so in this case, God, who has told Moses his personal name previously, is going to use several sentences now to actually unpack what his name means. And where he's not going to show him a physical picture of his full glory, he is going to unpack who he is for Moses to understand exactly what to expect as he deals with this God. So he says, Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord, who is merciful and compassionate. He he says, I am. Remember, that's what Yahweh means. I am the God who is merciful and compassionate. That sounds a little bit different than I am the God who is standing over you to condemn you right? Sounds a little bit different than I can't believe you did that, calling you whatever expletive name you think of God calling you in those moments. He says, no, I am the God who is merciful. 
I am the God who is compassionate, who cares, who wants the best for you. Ultimately, what he's saying here is he's saying, as God, I am not trying to find you out. In other words, he's saying, I already know, right? And remember, this is, this is being stated after the golden calf, after the different God, after the nation of Israel totally messed up. God says, let me remind you of who I am. I'm not the God who's standing over you, pointing my finger. I'm not trying to find you out, he says. I am offering to help you out. I'm offering to give you such a better life as we do life together, as I do life in camp with you. I am offering to help you out, not trying to find you out. He goes on and continues that thought in the next few sentences. He says this as he explains his name. He says, but... uh, Sorry, we we missed one verse there somewhere. Uh, Yeah, it says, I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. Again, not saying I am the God who is quick to judge. I am the God who is quick to make you guilty, quick to make you feel bad. He says, I am slow to anger. Filled, Filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. And listen to this. This is huge. He says, I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. You, you may be of the mindset that you say, yeah, yeah, God, God loves me, but <laughs> when I intentionally have turned my back on him, uh, yeah, I just feel him standing over me saying, I can't believe you did that. But did you dear, just hear how God described himself? He says, I forgive iniquity. I forgive rebellion. That moment where you knew you were doing the wrong thing and you did it anyway, God says, I want to be the God that covers that. I forgive your sin. (laughs) Entirely different picture than this God of guilt then this God of shame, then this God of every day looking for ways to punish you. Entirely different thought. And, and this God who does not lie is saying, this is my essence. This is my core. This is at the very fiber of my being. This is who I am. I'm the God who loves you with an unfailing love and faithfulness. I am the God who lavishes mercy and compassion on you. I'm the God who wants to dwell in your camp. It goes on and gives one final little explanation as he explains his name. And for all those that sit in the guilt camp that say, yeah, well, I think God is a God of guilt and God of punishment, this is the verse that they would point to, or this is the portion of the verse that they would point to. But here's what God says at the end of verse 7. He says, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. And and like I said, that's the part that some people will say, okay, yeah, God was being nice, but this overrides all of that, (laughs) right? Um, I I would say, what what did God say just before this? Before he says, I do not excuse the guilty, the very, very sentence before that was, I forgive the iniquity, the rebellion, and the sin. How do these two go together? There, there's a lot that we could say here, and it gets into generational stuff, as those verses said. Let me just explain it to you in the most simple way I know how. Essentially, these verses are like God saying, I want to walk with you. I want to do life with you. But it's almost like he's saying, but I'm a, the parent in the household, and I'm not going to change just because you want me to change. (laughs) 
It's almost like if you imagine a child coming to their parent and saying, hey, all my friends have found this new thing that they're doing, and they have so much fun with it, and I want to do it in our house, and it's called meth. And so I'm just wondering if I can bring the meth into the house, and we can do that here. Um, there's one type of parent that would say, oh, as long as you're doing it in our house, that should be fine, right? Um, God says, I'm not that parent. <laughs> he says, I'm the parent that's going to say, no, I want the best for you. I don't want you to go down that road because I love you too much to see you go down that road. And he says, just because you come to me and say, I want to do life differently than your rules, than your, your kingdom, um, God says, I'm not going to change just because you want to do it differently. You aren't excused from the consequences if you choose to do life differently than I ask you to do life here. But in spite of that, in spite of however you would want to interpret that portion of the name of God and the character of God, I think the very next thing that happens tells us exactly what we should know because the very next thing that happens is the way that Moses responds to this. Now, if Moses looked up and said, oh, wait a minute, God, we didn't know you and we didn't understand that it was going to be this hard and you weren't going to bend to our rules. We didn't know it was going to work that way. Um, I, I don't think we want to be a part of this. Then we would have every justification for saying, yeah, maybe God is a God of punishment and guilt because that's the way Moses understood what was said here. But listen to what happens. Instead of Moses pushing back and saying, no, we don't want to be a part of that, Here's what it says. Moses immediately threw himself to the ground and worshiped. And he said, O oh Lord, if it is true that I have found favor with you, then please travel with us. He says, God, we see now that you are a loving God. We see that you want the best for us. God, please travel with us. Don't make us do this alone. He says, I didn't know you before, God, but now I see your character through what you have said, and that just makes me want this all the more. Come dwell with us. Do life with us. Oh, loving God, the God who lavishes love on his people. Moses goes on and says in verse, at the end of verse 9, he says, yes, this is a stubborn and rebellious people. But please forgive our iniquity and our sins. Claim us as your own special possession. In other words, he says, we see your goodness. And we want to be a part of it. We need to be a part of it. Listen, guys, this is, this is ultimately what we're getting to here as we look through this passage where God says, this is who I am. By the way, this passage, this description of who God is, is quoted eight more times in the Old Testament as just a reminder of the fact that our God is not a God who's standing over us looking to punish us. He is a God who is standing over us wanting to lavish his love on us. And I believe what this is saying, what all of this is pointing to, is it's pointing to one very clear fact. Guilt is not God's goal. I don't care who taught you that. I don't care what institution or person put that in your head. Guilt is not God's goal. Unfailing love and faithfulness are at the heart of who he is. And as we walk through this study, as you go through this study over the next week, I don't know how you're going to process this because it may hit you in the way that it hit me where it feels like there's just this huge undercurrent of guilt. And man, if I don't check the boxes, if I don't do the right things, God is not going to like me. He's got not going to be pleased with me. And I think God comes to us just as he came to the people of Israel and says, I want you to know who I am. And I don't want you to feel like you're being driven just out of guilt. I want you to be wrapped in my arms. I want you to be gripped by my incredible, unfailing love and faithfulness toward you. So this week, 
as you go through this study, this week as you process the, the idea of having a clear conscience. I hope that you really will get to a place of having a clear conscience, but I hope it's not a thing that is driven by a God who is standing over you saying, you need to check the box. Instead, I think God says, I know where you've been. I know what's happened. I know the things that you have been through, the things that you have stepped into. (laughs) And I still want to be with you. I still want to be your God. I still want to pour out my lavish love and faithfulness into your world. Guilt is not God's goal. As you listen for his voice this week, this is my challenge to you. Maybe you've heard that voice in the back of your head that every time you think it's God's voice, it sounds like that preacher who beat you down for so long. (laughs) Maybe every time you hear what you think is the voice of God in your head, it sounds like that nun from school who told you you would never be good enough. But I want you to go to God and say, God, will you replace that false guilt, that false voice of guilt with your voice so that I can truly hear you this week? If you're telling me that you are the God who is slow to anger and abounding in love, will you sing that over me this week so that it resonates in my heart, in my mind, in my ears? Will you help me to know who you really are at your core, at your character? Guys, this is so, so important. God loves you desperately. He wants to do life with you. And he wants you to know that his voice is not the voice of condemnation. Will you do life with him this week? Let's go to him and ask him to help us with this. Father, we come to you and we just admit we all have our own struggles. We all have our own tendencies um, to fall into things that obviously we shouldn't be a part of. We all are sinners. We are broken, God, and we need you. But we need you as the God that you really are, not the voice of guilt and shame that has been spoken over us in the past. Father, as we walk through seeking him, the study, I pray that we truly would find you. I pray that this would be a thing that is healthy and positive and encouraging for us. And I pray that we would experience you in ways that we never have before. But help us to experience the real you, God. We want to know your voice. We want you in the camp with us. We love you so much, and we pray these things in the power of your name, Jesus. Amen.